Hello, welcome to another video. In the previous video, I just by differentiation using implicit differentiation, I was able to show you the derivative of inverse secant or arc secant of x. Now I want to show you the same answer using the definition of the derivative. And I already set myself up to start the work. Remember that the definition um, of the derivative of a function is basically the limit as h goes to zero of the function when you evaluate at x plus h minus the function evaluated at x divided by h. So in order to get things cleaned up so I don't have to repeat the explanation uh, after a while, I just want to show you the basic assumptions that I make for all of these. Now what I'm going to say is, I'm going to say let A be equal to um, the secant, inverse secant of x plus h. So if I take the secant of both of these, it simply means that the secant of A is equal to x plus h. And I can do the same thing here, and I can say let b be equal to inverse secant of x, so that the same thing, or let me write it here, I can say that the secant of b is equal to just x. So if I subtract this from this, I'm going to have h is equal to secant a minus secant b. Okay, that's, that's what I need. I need this essentially. I need to be able to show that secant A is equal, minus secant B is the H. So watch this. As H goes to zero, this expression goes closer to zero, and this can go close to zero only if secant A goes close to secant B. And secant A can only go to secant B, and go close to secant B if A is going to B. I already explained that in other videos. So. I'm just going to write a conclusion that as h approaches 0, secant a minus secant b approaches 0, or you can say secant a minus secant b approaches, no, secant a approaches secant b. That's another way you can say it. Or you can say that a minus b approaches zero or one last one or you can say a approaches b so all of these are equivalent as far as this is concerned so at any point depending on which one is relevant to the line i am working on i can say well definitely i'm not going to be using as h goes to zero i'm just going to be using secant a minus secant b goes to zero on this assumption or i might use this or i might use this or i might use a goes to b or a minus b goes to zero Okay, so let's go back to this definition because this is all we need to work on. All these are just um, preparations. So I go back here and say, I'm going to write A here because we said let A represent this. So I'm going to say that F prime, I don't like this chalk. F prime of X is equal to the limit as H goes to zero. Okay, now that I'm going to be replacing all the h's, so maybe I shouldn't write as h goes to zero. I think I should write the limit as the easier one, as secant a goes to secant b. As secant a approaches secant b of, this is going to be a minus b. See, a minus b over h, and we said h is secant a minus secant b. Secant a minus secant b. So what does this tell me? It tells me that I can write secant a minus secant b in terms of cosine. I'm going to do it here because the next line um, is going to be what I'm really looking for. So let's quickly work on this one. Um, secant a is 1 over cosine a and secant b is 1 over cosine b. If I choose to write this together, it means I'm going to have cosine a cosine b, and this would be cosine b minus cosine a. 
um, but I really want to have cosine A minus cosine B, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a minus and say this is equal to minus cosine A minus cosine B over cosine A cosine B. You see this minus has reversed this so that the top will still remain the same. So now this expression in the denominator can be plugged in, but you know when I plug this in here, this is gonna flip to the top so that this expression is the limit as secant A goes to secant B of this cosine A cosine B goes to the top. So this expression becomes A minus B times cosine A, cosine B over cosine A minus cosine B. Let's put this in braces like that. Okay, so it's better to put the parentheses here just to make sure that this negative is distributed across. Now, if I can simplify this using any trig identity that works, we'll be done. Okay, let's clean this up. So see what I'm gonna do? I am going to replace cosine A minus cosine B with an identity that you should be familiar with. If you're not, well, we're gonna see how it works out. Now, let's say this is still the same thing. I'm trying to save space here. This is gonna be the limit as, now instead of writing secant A goes to secant B, I'm gonna say as, um, a minus B goes to zero, because remember I told you I could use any of these, okay? Because of what I'm about to do next, as A minus B goes to zero of A minus B times cosine A cosine B divided by, there's a negative sign. Now I want to write cosine A minus cosine B. Cosine A minus cosine B is the same thing as negative two sine A plus B over two sine A minus B over two. That's another way to write cosine A minus cosine B. Okay. So this negative cancels out this negative. So that saves us. We don't need to deal with that. And this is the same thing as, remember, A minus B is approaching zero. So if A minus B is approaching zero, then we have a situation here where this is going to zero and this is going to zero. Now I'm gonna split this in a very nice way. So this is the same thing as the limit as A minus B approaches zero such that um, I'm gonna put this on top of this and I'm gonna put this on top of this. So let's write it this way. Cosine A, cosine B over negative times negatives gives you a plus. So I'm going to write two sine A plus B over two here. A minus B over See, it's a multiplication. So the other part that I have not included is this part. Sine A minus B over two. Yes, the end is near. Okay, so remember, this is an identity that you have to be used to by now if you've been watching my videos, when you have the limit as theta goes to zero of theta over sine theta, this will always be one, as long as this goes to zero and this goes to zero. As you can see, what is here will go to zero, but it's not exactly what is here. So what I'm going to do is, I want this and this to be the same. So I'm going to write this as a minus b over two, then multiply it by two, so I can actually rewrite this expression. a minus b over two, times two. So now I have exactly what I'm looking for. This goes to zero, this goes to zero. If you take this limit of this one, applying the product rule for limits, this will go to one, but this two, I can actually move the two here because it's still multiplication. So 
Yeah, we're done. So this expression becomes one. What do you think is happening as A minus B approaches zero? It means A is approaching B, right? If A is approaching B, it means cosine A will become cosine B eventually at the limit of this. So this becomes two cosine B cosine B, which is two cosine squared B. Okay, oh, this two cancels out. Okay, so these twos will cancel out. So what you have left is basically cosine squared B over, this two is gone, so let's cancel them out. This is, as A approaches B, or A minus B goes to zero, A B will become B, so this becomes two B, B plus B over two, which is just B over sine B. That's it, we're done, let's get rid of this. So as you can see, this is the same thing as cosine squared B over sine B. Whatever this gives us is the derivative because we're done. So let's go back to the tri- Oh, we did not sketch a triangle. Okay, let's sketch a triangle here. Let's make a box. Mm. The triangle is always essential once you make this um, substitution. We said secant B is equal to X. So we have a triangle like this. This is the angle B. Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So X is the same thing as X over one. So it's gonna be X over one. And we can solve this by calculating X squared minus one. Using Pythagoras rule, we know this is what we're gonna have now. So what is cosine squared B? This, what is cosine? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine squared will be one over X squared. So it's one over X squared divided by, and what is sine b? Sine b is opposite over hypotenuse. It's gonna be the square root of x squared minus one divided by x. So as you can see, this is a complex fraction. To get rid of a complex fraction, look at the denominators. This is x squared, this is x. So use x squared to multiply the top and bottom. If you do that to the top, you're gonna to have one. If you multiply the bottom by x squared, you're gonna be left with x and the square root of x squared minus one. And this is the derivative. Let's write it nicely, nicely, f prime of x. So this is the derivative from first principles of secant inverse of x. Now remember the conditions that I showed in the other case that um, because of the nature of secant, the inverse secant cannot have um, inputs from negative one to one. So you have to avoid any number. So listen, x must be greater than one or x must be less than negative one. It has to be one of these two. And the nice way to put that is to say it this way, to say the absolute value of x must be greater than one. This is a nice way to put it. And this is your answer. The derivative of inverse secant of x. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning have stopped living. Bye-bye.